It's showtime, folks. Enjoy the show. A fine Saturday matinee to you, gentlemen. Steve, Andy, hello. Guten Morgen. Top of the morning to you. Hey, he brought his lucky charms. <laughs> I, I, I think my accent's as good as Dick Van Dyke. I think that's where I'm at. <laughs> it might be. Aspire to greatness. <laughs> What's going on? How's your movie lives? Uh, movie life? <laughs> <laughs> Andy, you have been buried. You have been really buried. Are you okay? I've been working on a project. Yeah. Did you finish it? So, yeah. So, my movie life has been involving uh, uh, making something and so. and how do you feel because you had a rap party last night you got to feel good tired but good i do i do everyone was happy yeah joyous times joyous times it was just an exhausting uh project but uh it was a fun one it was a lot of fun uh so you haven't you probably haven't uh haven't seen anything uh of the footage no that we shot? movies i don't care about your footage <laughs> oh, yeah i've seen, I've seen cares about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's all i've seen all right friend. That's all, all right <laughs> well i'm glad you're back to uh back to reality uh, what's going on with you steve i'm still trying to catch up on my uh oscar you know knobs so i have gotten around finally caught uh dunkirk and the post starring street hanks <laughs> uh Oh no! Don't turn. Oh, it's a thing. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, no, I it's uh, I just you know never got out to see Dunkirk, so caught that one on you know at home, and I yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't know that I would have enjoyed it, you know, on the big IMAX. Maybe I don't. I don't know. It's just I I think it's an interesting structure to the film. I was puzzled by when I was googling some stuff that people were like you know are you confused by the timeline in dunkirk and i thought are you a a coherent conscious person it's not that complicated well if you you doze off for (laughs) even a few seconds you could really you could get really confused (laughs) yeah that's true and and i enjoyed it i thought it it worked well i just didn't you know i sort of had it up to here with world war ii movies and did this bring something new i didn't know if it was trying to say something about the british empire with the little voiceover at the end of what that might be trying to accomplish but i don't i don't have issues with it is it a a great film eh, no i i enjoyed it. i don't know why tom hardy had to you know was sort of disguised or his identity was hidden the whole time he's the one fighter pilot with you know a full master you can't see who he is and then at the end it comes off i'm like oh it's tom hardy was that because it was going to be distracting to know it was tom hardy throughout the movie i you didn't, didn't understand really why it was necessary. i didn't i didn't even give that a second of thought i feel like i knew it was tom hardy either and he was just in a mask because he's a fighter pilot yeah but the other guy wasn't so i was like well how come he's got different you know the other guy we can see his face why is tom hardy like you know like the scarecrow with the huge like canvas bag <laughs> for the whole thing. I didn't have uh, a canvas so that would have been, been awesome <laughs> that's the movie i want to see <laughs> I didn't even know. I'm actually Scarecrow taking a star away from World my War review II. of Dunkirk because it wasn't Scarecrow in the cockpit. <laughs> uh, I, I, I that makes me that makes me a little sad, but uh, but I, I get it. I get it. Believe me, I know that I, I apparently yeah, disagree with people on some movies. That, you, you can disagree all you want. You can you can be wrong all the time. That's not a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I uh, haven't seen the Cloverfield Paradox yet, but my goodness, I can't wait. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, yeah you can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. I mean, you you Let's watched it, right? I mean, I, w- I was really, yeah, I was really excited about it. And because I, I love the first two Cloverfield movies and this one, yeah, really was a case of we're going to take something and we're going to just slap the Cloverfield, you know, brand on it and, you know, throw something on the end to make it fit in the Cloverfield universe. And number one, that did not work. And secondly, it, the story itself was not that great. It was a typical, like, Oh, there's a team on a space station and space madness breaks out. And then weird things happen for no logical explainable reason, other than it's weird stuff that happens because, interdimensional nonsense and (laughs) that those movies are fine there's plenty of them but i'm like for me the cloverfield the the stories always stand on their own really really well even if you take out 
you know, the the monster stuff. There's really interesting character stuff going on in the first one and the, you know, 10 Cloverfield Lane. That one, if it wasn't even in the Cloverfield universe, you, you've still got a really great story going on there. This one, you've got eh, like B grade, you know, story that's struggling. And then you slap Cloverfield nonsense at the end. And it just, yeah. That pretty much feels like their important. entire Cloverfield yeah. strategy. Now, I, are we going to get into well, this? Well, you, you speaking of wrong, <laughs> <laughs> I I don't think there's anything to get into, but uh, be, because of your position on it, <laughs> but uh, but I feel exactly the same way about Ten Cloverfield Lane, with the exception of the fact that Ten Cloverfield Lane was a great movie until they slapped Cloverfield on the end of it. Uh, and and I think that was that's their whole strategy. It was a it was a movie that was originally supposed to be something else, and now it's this. And I I find that really frustrating. So I, I I'm not surprised in the least that they did that with the Cloverfield paradox. And uh yeah. and, and it feels like they that that strategy is played. I'm gonna are, are we not gonna be surprised if Cloverfield ever gets another anything? Oh, they are. They Paramount's got they've got the fourth one that's uh, the it's like set in World War Two. I think. Hmm, so that's interesting which i guess that's that one i think is still set for theatrical release because i think the cloverfield paradox well that was what it was god particle and then like they scooped it up and said we're gonna now make this a cloverfield Mm -hmm. thing so i i i have haven't done thorough research but i think the fourth one was at least planned to be a cloverfield thing from the outset so that gives me some hope that it's not just being shoehorned in to try to just fit something in there. It's also, you know, perhaps a sign that the studio realized, you know, maybe it wasn't as good as we wanted it to be when they, uh, after spending, I mean, quite a chunk of money on, on this film to just then, uh, decide to, uh, pull it from theatrical release and just go direct to Netflix, which I guess is also a new thing. Yeah. That's the thing I don't understand. Uh, And I guess I don't have enough insight into, the financial structure that makes Netflix work. But if I, if it's in the theater and lots of people buy tickets, that's more money. Netflix paid $50 million for Cloverfield and whether one person watches it or, you know, 6 million people watch it. Netflix doesn't make any different amount of money because they're all subscription. I mean, their income is subscriptions. So unless people are signing up for Netflix because, oh, I need to see Cloverfield Paradox, to me, their their revenue is not changing based on the number of people that watch anything. So that's the puzzle that I don't understand as Netflix is scooping these things up that doesn't matter how many people watch. So I, I don't understand how they you know can afford to dump 50 million in there when it doesn't matter. You know. It's it's really interesting because they're going to um, – well, I mean, to, I can see why the studio – um, may see it as an, uh, well, I don't know. Even that doesn't make total sense to me because it's not like they're making film prints anymore. Right. Yeah. Film prints was an expensive, uh, option when they had a film to, uh, to make these prints and get it out to the theater. I mean, that whole part of the budget was rather expensive. Now it's like, and maybe I just don't, don't fully understand the costs of the, the, quote prints now but as far as like creating the digital file that goes on the little drive that gets shipped around um i think it's probably a lot cheaper than what the cost of a print used to be just guessing though um but still it's like is it's not going to cost that much to put it out into theaters i mean obviously then you still have to kind of deal with the theaters and pay that split but then you're you're doing the same thing with netflix so where does the cost lie and how do they get their money back yeah it's a very interesting uh, method that they have. And I, I, I'd i love to see at some point some kind of uh, financials, especially, I mean, we talk about financials on the show. It's like, what does this mean for financials when we're looking at, you know, how much a movie ends up making back? I, I really have no idea anymore. You know, and, and especially reading one of uh, uh, Steve's links uh, for this morning, yet another movie is scooped up by Netflix. You know, after especially after we talked about Annihilation next uh, for or last week being scooped up for international uh, by Netflix. Yeah, and, and that's and I think I guess for our generation of, of film watchers, 
the analogy that I often think of is like when you don't get a theatrical release, you go straight to Netflix. It's like that, you know, good old straight to video where it's it's stuff that just gets dumped, you know, for rental at, you know, Blockbuster back in the yeah. day where it, there's there, it, there's something about theatrical release that still lends an air of legitimacy to a film. Whereas when it gets that straight to video, it's like, oh, it's not it's it's second tier. It's not of a certain quality. And I think that's, you know, a false assumption because there's a lot of really good stuff that goes straight to video and there's, you know, lots of other reasons and, you know, a lot back in the day, you know, cost of prints and then there's marketing, all of the, those costs that sometimes you just can't compete for that screen space. So you get that release. This one here, it was Paramount, you know, people say they, they dumped it to Netflix. So, you know, cut their losses. So to me, it'll be an interesting model to watch to see how this plays out with something like Annihilation that's been getting, you know, you've got a great cast, you've got Alex Garland directing, you know, did Ex Machina, so it's, everything tells me this should be a really solid film, it's been, you know, touted as this, like, very intellectual sci-fi film, like, The Arrival, see, you know, what this international distribution model does, and maybe we, as Netflix broadens its, its reach, it becomes a, you know, doesn't be it's not seen as a second tier release but still like well for whatever reason this just functions to get it to the right audience faster because mm -hmm. you think about a lot of films that uh don't you know that discovered they got discovered and were big once they got on cable or or video they they you know floundered in the theaters because maybe they were mismarketed and then they find their audience this might be that plan to well we're going to find our audience on the first time around instead of wasting you know time and money getting it on screens in the theaters you see every see how excited everyone is about Star Wars. Uh, now they're talking about the Game of Thrones showrunners D.B. Weiss and David Benioff are uh, slated to helm an entire film series uh, or an entire uh, film series themselves of the beloved science fiction franchise. Uh, lots of news from Star Wars. And I posted this <laughs> into the to the uh, discord and there was exactly no excitement at all. And I feel <laughs> I feel like that is a sign in of itself. <laughs> well, okay. There's so much about this article that bothers me. Okay. And so, so this is, this is my take on things like this. We are in an era now where we're like the internet has allowed this give and take back and forth. And sometimes I'll read an article or it'll be posted on Facebook or something and it'll be a, you know, hey, here's this news. What do you think? And so now fans feel like they have some input or voice into this. It wasn't like, oh, hey, you know, Empire Strikes Back, you know, this happened. What did you guys think? There was no online forum for people to vent about how they felt about the big reveal of Empire Strikes Back. You just took it as it was. It was given to you. You took it. And maybe you chatted with your friends about it. Now we have this whole thing where people feel like they own you know, some rights to this this property or the creators owe them something because they've been able to express their opinion about what it should be online. I mean, the whole Last Jedi backlash of, well, you know, this is my opinion about what it should have been. I'm like, I don't care. It was Ryan Johnson's film. The studio gave him that. Let him go. It's the same feeling I have about this. It, they've got a larger sandbox to play in. Now they're they're broadening the scope of this intellectual property. They have the right to do this. I have the right to not watch it if I don't want to see it, you know, Disney and Lucasfilm, they don't owe me anything. They have the right to make whatever they want. And I have the right to enjoy it or hate it on my own. But this whole idea that like fans or community can, you know, be disgruntled about something and the, you know, the studio is wrong about that. It's a business. They're looking to make stuff that makes, you know, them money. And you've got, you know, artists that have an opportunity to make something. I mean, Pete, what if our fans said, hey, you know, you're diluting, you know, the next real name because you've got way too many sideshows going off this. You got Trailer Rewind and Tommy's doing a thing. And it's it should just be about you and, and Andy talking about movies because that's what's the truest next real. And all these sideshows are just, you know, <laughs> diluting the, the brand name. You know, I enjoy I enjoy what I do. I, you know, you're totally right. Of course, that is a very uh, a, a sort of logical place to be with this whole thing. I think my point is a little bit different, though, which is, uh, is it, it, it it's more of a position of mourning. Like, I I am sad that there is such lack of enthusiasm at this point about what otherwise I would call great news. I think it's I think, you know, if I step away from the fact that I'm just sort of Star Wars exhausted right now, D.B. Weiss and David Benioff taking on a series uh, of, uh, you know, if in this universe that I really do love is great news. And so 
isn't it a little bit sad that we're at this point where that great news is met with kind of a sigh because, oh my goodness, it it has become like they've turned Star Wars into something that has that is you know it's Marvel and and I think that's the the comparison that that we're looking at here. Like, is it is it sad that they have they've sort of sucked uh, the the energy or one position is that they've sucked the energy and enthusiasm out of this such that their you know their press is uh, is, is no longer all that exciting. I, I, I side with Steve on this. It's just, it's one of those things where, I mean, I, I'm excited. I'm interested. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, sure. I don't, it's, I mean, Star Wars was something where there were large gaps of time between the first trilogy and the second trilogy, and then another large gap of time before we started getting into the new ones. It was really just, you know, about the, the amount of time that people were waiting. And it, you, to a certain extent, uh, kind of like what was Steve, Steve was saying, it's like, you know, people wanted more. We're getting more, and now people are going to complain because now we have too much. Uh, you know, it's you're never going to win, and so their option is to just keep making stuff. and And people can complain all they want, but in in the end, you really are just going to have to wait until stuff is released and then decide. Okay, well, I'm I'm actually now I'm I'm very excited about that because it actually ended up being very good. And you know, you can it's it's just one of those things. I mean. They're going to be cranking stuff out and, and, you know, people can be excited about it or not, but it is a business and people are just putting stuff out there and, and, uh, you know, doing their best to try making creative stuff that, that is going to be enjoyable. So the fact that it's quote diluting the, the market or the joy of Star Wars, I mean, I think it just, it, it just gets to be kind of a silly thing. And if that's, if that's how people feel about it, you know, go, go throw rocks at the kids from your lawn and, uh, you know, just cling to cling to four or five and six. Please don't throw rocks at anybody. <laughs> That's not advice. <laughs> well, where were all these, these complaining fans when you had all that Star Wars expanded universe, you know, all those books coming out? Were, were people complaining like, oh, there's too much, you know, Star Wars stuff out there. There's all these <laughs> stories and it's way too much. No. They didn't care. People don't read, Steve. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's the thing. And so then they take that away. Lucas, you know, Disney says, okay, that's not canon. We're opening it up for stories. They're just doing the same thing. They're doing it in the for the media that they're successful at, which is, you know, film. You know, we've got Clone Wars and whatever, Star Wars Rebels on TV. I, this is shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. I, I'm sad that people aren't excited about it because there should always be some some joy for something that you have that close connection to. And unfortunately it grows to the point where it's going to now grow beyond that personal connection. Everybody had with Luke growing up, it's becoming a much larger story. So yeah, it's going to be harder to have that connection. That's, I was always more of a star Wars person than a star Trek person when I was a you know young adolescent, because for me, star Wars was about, you know, good versus evil and a personal journey of Luke and star Trek was, you know, large political schemes going on. And now star Wars is starting to have to reach beyond that, where it's no longer the story of one person discovering their place in the battle of, of good versus evil. There's so many more stories. And I think that's the transition that is going to be troubling because you We'll have different characters that people are going to have stories told about. And I think different genres, as we see with, you know, the solo film that the tone of that film and what that film is going to be is going to be very different from other Star Wars movies we've seen. Even, you know, Rogue One sort of had that feel of it. You know, it's it's a Star Wars film. It's this type of genre. But now we're starting to get into the possibility of these standalones that as we've you know sort of celebrated in the Marvel universe, you can tell different you know, have different genres yeah. uh, within that and universe. I, you know, I think part of the problem, and I want to come at this from a little bit of a different angle, um, part of the problem that I have with it is media exhaustion. And I think that one of the things that they're not doing well over there. And and I have to say, it's because, you know, I, I have a, a day job background in public relations for many, many years, that one of the things they're not doing very well uh, under, you know, Kennedy's leadership is keeping these things secret. Uh, I, I think that we would be better served if we didn't know that the Game of Thrones team was coming over to do uh, to do a series until yeah. the first teaser drops, until the trailer drops. Like, let's just keep it a secret. Let's follow some of these, um, you know, tried and true rules of closed sets of closed contracts and not 
get everything out into variety as fast, uh, hard and fast as we possibly can and, and let the fans breathe. The fans will be excited when this thing drops. They'll be excited maybe in favor and maybe against, but there will be energy around this stuff. Uh, I, I think, you know, because it has the, the name Star Wars, uh, it, it gets reprinted everywhere and that's where the exhaustion comes from. Um, and, and so I, I really think that there is, there's a lot of room for a big experience expanded cinematic universe for Star Wars. I, I also think that it's, uh, you know, we've reached this point where they need to revisit their their press strategy because it's not a good one. I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know. Because it, it, then it turns into Cloverfield and it's, you know, these these big, you know, mystery things of, you know, is, you know, is there no, something going on? No, Who knows? No, no, no. I, you know, I think it no. gets to the point where it just is silly. And it's it's like... You know, I, I don't know. It's just people are going to have exhaustion if they're paying attention and and they're going to have exhaustion if they're not. And people are going to whine and complain no matter how you slice it. So that is on know, that we agree. But forward. I totally disagree. You don't have to have a you don't have to make it like Cloverfield. You don't have to make the mystery box the press campaign. You just have to not tell everybody every move you're making uh, from the business uh, perspective. You, you really don't have to do that. And, and they're making a choice to do that. And that's where the exhaustion comes from. So that's that's the the point I'm trying to make. There was should we just uh, we've we've got even some more news, but I think we can move right into trailers. Shall we move into trailers? We Let's can move do it. Through. Yes. Uh, all right, um, Andy, you were gone last week. Why don't you do for, go first? Well, so for my my trailer, um, you guys know I I really enjoy uh, Melissa McCarthy and her films, and uh, a new trailer dropped, and it just it looks really funny. It looks exactly like what I would expect it to be, but it still makes me laugh. The film is Life of the Party. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's her new film, uh, directed by, uh, her husband, uh, Ben Falcone. And it's a, you know, it's a story about a, uh, mom who, uh, gets divorced and, uh, has a lot of anger about her, her, her ex and, uh, the, the path she's taken in her life of being a stay at home mom. And so, uh, while her daughter's at college, she comes to visit and says, surprise, I'm coming back to college too. So I can finally make something of my life. And it's, that's pretty much the, the story in the trailer is the, the silliness that ensues when uh, your mother, Melissa McCarthy joins you at college. It, uh, it's, it's back to school, right? It just, it's like back to school with Melissa McCarthy. It, exactly. Uh, it's got Melissa McCarthy as the mom, uh, Molly Gordon as her daughter, uh, Matt Walsh as her ex. It also has uh, Jillian Jacobs, Maya Rudolph, Jackie Weaver, uh, Steven Root. Uh, it's got, you know, a really fun cast and it's, it's got kind of, I guess what I would say is kind of the typical comedy that, uh, that has, uh, come to be known for, uh, Melissa McCarthy in her films where it's, you know, it's, it's that, that giggly cuteness that she has with some rather crass elements that, uh, that seems to make it extra funny for me. So, uh, that's my trailer this week. What did you guys think? I thought, oh, this is Andy's trailer. Like I saw that, I saw that trailer uh, that when that dropped, and I thought, "This is Andy's trailer. I can't touch this one." <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I still, I still haven't seen Spy. Um, I know I can't. I, I don't know what it is. Like if there's, I know that I'm gonna find it funny. I know that you've said it's funny, and I have to just see it. But I, I just haven't, I haven't gotten there. I, I do. I think she's really funny, and I think this, the trailer looks, it looks great. I think this is, this is a wonderful fish out of water story, and I think it, it's, uh, it, it's tried and true narrative, and Melissa McCarthy doing it is, I, I think, a, a great match. But, uh, uh, and, and I regret that I haven't seen more of her stuff. So I, I, I'll see this at some point. And I'll probably enjoy it. There you go. But still see Spy yeah, okay. first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, I, I was pleased to see this is PG-13 because I, I, I like, that's sort of like the sweet spot for me for comedies like this. Because sometimes you get R-rated and it, the, the humor just gets way too crude and crass that it just can be uncomfortable. Uh, so this is one I'm like, ah, I can sit with my kids. We can watch this. We can laugh and have a really good time, especially since I've got, you know, one going off to college next year. This is a... Uh, one that I can imagine the family going to see and having a really good time with. And then your girls will start talking about their vagoogles. <laughs> oh, God. No. Oh, God. Like voluntarily no. going into a haunted house. <laughs> that was so bad. Oh, Melissa. Oh, my. Well, this one is going to be... Uh, 
Opening here uh, May 11th. That's the release date for that one. So, uh, yeah, there it is. All right, Steve, what's yours? Uh, What is mine? Mine is called Spinning Man. So, which I had not heard of, wasn't on my radar, but it caught my eye because of the cast. Because we've got Minnie Driver and Pierce Brosnan and Guy Pierce and Clark Gregg. And I thought, oh my gosh, what what project is attracting this team together? What what is this? And it's one of these, you know, thrillers. And I I'm expecting it to maybe be a big disappointment, but I'm hoping with this cast that there's, you know, some good performances and a decent story. But it's the story of a, a professor who is a suspect when a student goes missing and he's a like a philosophy professor. There's all kinds of discussion in the trailer about, well, what is really truth? And he can't remember things. And so there's a question of, did he really do it? Is he being set up? Is something else going on? So for me, it's one of these things that I won't see in theaters. I'll probably catch it on, you know, Netflix or, or whatever, but it just, there's something in the structure of how that story is presented that I, these are things I enjoy where there's questions of what really happened. And is he an innocent man? Is he being deceptive? Is there something else going on? And I think just this cast is something that I am willing to go along that ride with them on. What I, I find fascinating about the, the uh, film is from the uh, Wikipedia entry. It says Evan Birch is a professor and family man whose past reveals a number of illicit relations with his students. When a young woman is found murdered, Evan, who is also a world famous plate spinner <laughs> becomes the prime suspect. <laughs> what? They don't show that what? in the trailer. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> oh, wow! All of a sudden, that... it just enters the land of comedy. <laughs> oh, world no. famous plate spinner. <laughs> what? He's That's been known to get inside be. of cars with a lot of clowns. <laughs> wow! See, and I thought this—I thought Spinning Man was sort of like okay. He's, you know, somebody that's out there that's going to spin the truth. <laughs> I did too. But no. Oh, they just gosh. lost me. Okay. They just lost me. They, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but what it's, so the, this is direct, uh, from director Simon Kai, Kaiser. Uh, he's done a lot of TV. This is his first film. Um, and then writer Matthew Aldrich, who wrote Coco and also Cleaner, which was a 2007 Rennie Harlan film I've never heard of that has Samuel Jackson in it. And those are his two writing credits. So not a lot of, you know, baggage that's coming to this as far as i can point to trends or projects they've done so again positive as this is something new and exciting to hungry young artists wanting to do something really good i hope and you know i i will say it looks interesting and i i it has a memento vibe with guy pierce uh, with his character that that does appeal to me so um so i am curious this is something that i i would probably uh put on on netflix and check out I, I don't know I don't know about what's going on with Pierce Brosnan's voice. There's he's he, there's some <laughs> affectation there that feels false to me, uh, which is kind of hard to listen to because it's just sudden he doesn't sound like himself. It's like putting on an accent, you know. It's it's uh, it's very strange. But uh, I was it sounded like his. It danger was it might have been his danger. <laughs> 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 uh, I I feel like uh, I, this is I'm right with you. This is one that I would have been much more excited about before I heard about plate spinning. Uh, but I it, I probably will catch it on Netflix. That's that's about where. Where I where I slate this, it's got a 2018 release date. That's that's all we've got. So we, I have no idea if it is going to go to theaters or it may be one of those straight to Netflix things. Yeah, on Wikipedia it says April 6th. Oh, okay. All right. Well, speaking of things I'm not going to see on Netflix, uh, at least at first, I, my trailer is Mission Impossible Fallout, which uh, you know I was a big fan of Rogue Nation. That was a super fun action spy movie, and the fact that Tom Cruise is now 55 years old and he is still doing the kinds of things that he is doing uh, in these movies is amazing. A freight train Cruise is back, and he's running from explosions, and he's jumping, and he's in helicopters uh, and the trailer is is fantastic but i have to tell you about a specific moment in the trailer that is in the trailer and is in the film that i heard Cruz talking about with the cast on the graham norton show and he had had brought with him on the show multiple angles all the kid five cameras capturing this particular stunt and the stunt is right about uh at the two minute and 10 second mark in the trailer there are two buildings that are very far apart and he is running as fast as he can from one building he has to jump and he's all wired up right and so he jumps this is tom cruise doing this stunt jumping from one building to 
into another building. And the stunt is he's supposed to hit the building at his chest. Like, he doesn't make it. Henry Cavill is he's chasing Henry Cavill, and Cavill makes it and runs all the way across. Cruz doesn't. He hits the building and has to climb up and continue running. And at this point in the trailer, the clip he says on Graham Norton that they include in the film because they only got this take of it. <laughs> he runs, he jumps, and if you pause it, you'll see his right foot hits the building so hard that it breaks backward. And literally, oh. he breaks his foot in the scene that is in the movie. It's quick. You can slow it down and see it. They showed the close-up angle of this particular shot uh, on the Norton show, and it was nauseating. But what does Tom Cruise do? What does Tom Cruise do? He gets up and continues running to finish the scene. <laughs> and he says to the crew, he says, I'm sorry, guys, it's broken. I'm out. Uh, and they closed down production of his part for six weeks. Uh, but he knew that this was the shot that they had to get. They had to get this because they weren't going to come back to this location. So he had to keep running. And so he put that grimace on his face, that Tom Cruise grimace, and he kept going. Amazing, Tom Cruise. Amazing. That man just blows me away with everything wow. he does. I mean, it's it's always It's always, you know, 11%. Uh, I mean, eleven percent. It's always hundred <laughs> percent wow. cranked up, <laughs> cranked up to eleven. That it's, it's early still, and I'm tired. <laughs> now, okay, maybe on the mummy he gave eleven yeah, right. percent, but <laughs> right. but yeah, to cranked up to eleven. God, I'm mis mixing up all my numbers. <laughs> it's cranked up to eleven. Uh, clearly, I've been staring at numbers for two. Check the spreadsheet, Andy. Now. Check the spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, 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 and it's another Mission Impossible film, yeah. uh, which is a series that uh, you know just keeps getting in better, uh, better and better. As far as I'm concerned, so uh, very excited with that, with the helicopter stunts, just everything going on here. I think looks really interesting, and I think Christopher McQuarrie and and Cruz uh, working as a pair, I think um, they can do some interesting stuff. So I know, I know the. Um, uh, you know, the, the first Jack Reacher film that they did together was uh, quite exciting. And then the last mission impossible film. So I'm excited about this one too. Yeah. I, I'm on board. I, I really you know, am enjoying the sort of reboot. They've taken the mission impossible franchise and it's just, it's been solid. Uh, thrill ride for the summer really looking forward to this one uh, I, I do have questions about Henry Cavill's mustache of like, this is the controversial mustache that had to be digitally removed from, <laughs> from Justice right, League because he he couldn't he couldn't shave it off. And I was like watching this trailer. I'm like, what's I guess because they hadn't finished shooting this, and so it was easier to digitally remove it than digitally add a mustache. But I thought, well, I, I guess it's understanding the timing. But I'm like, I don't understand how that mustache is so crucial to that character unless it's supposed to make him seem like sort of a shady, you know skeezy kind of guy because he's got a cheesy mustache well the lesson i think everybody learned is don't ever give henry cavill a mustache yeah there's uh, yeah well and it also could be one of those things where i mean if they were already knee deep into production on this and you already had yeah. the mustache yeah it's you know then it, then you hit a point where it's like well sorry it's already there we can't mm -hmm. go back and reshoot our stuff yeah, yeah. I am a big fan, like you said, Andy, of the last uh, the last one, Rogue Nation, I thought was terrific. The rest of the cast is back. Rebecca Ferguson uh, with, you know, obviously we have Henry Cavill. We've got Michelle Monaghan back, Angela Bassett, Simon Pegg, Alec Baldwin. Uh, you know, it's Ving Rhames. Uh, everybody's everybody's back. All the people we care about are back. It's it, this is this is a, a really great action franchise. I'm very excited about it. This one comes out uh, July 27th. 2018 uh I, one more tom cruise story because tom cruise he's telling the story they're they're going around the cast and asking what did you do with your first paycheck when you hit it you know big when you had your first big movie i'm an actor paycheck and henry cavill says well i bought an austin martin you know he's like i'm he's i'm rich now i'm gonna drive a rich man's car and they go, they go around and everybody tells their thing and and he says tom cruise what did you do he's last on the couch and he says well I, I remember what i did he's kind of cagey about it and i said come on come on what'd you do he says he takes a beat and he says well i i i paid for my younger sister to go to college <laughs> oh tom cruise <laughs> tom cruise let's talk about our lists oh dear now andy 
<laughs> now, Annie, you weren't here last week. I hadn't watched the movie. JJ certainly hadn't watched the movie. And so we ended up with, I think, Frankenstein's list, a list that sort of <laughs> it sort of makes sense when you put the elements together. And now that I've seen the movie, of course, the young uh, girls of Rochefort, I recognize that it was loosely uh, it was loosely attached. Our list topic was loosely attached to the film. I, I think all things being equal, we did a pretty good job. Uh, but note to self, Pete never <laughs> is allowed to participate in choosing lists again. Uh, that's that's your job. And we need to straighten that out for uh, in perpetuity. Uh, the list that we chose. Yeah, I'm not sure there was a mistaken identity. Well, there was. The, I, there was. In the okay, now I can. <laughs> it was there. There, there is, is a little bit. You got identity. the. Uh, yeah. there, who's whose identity is mistaken? There's this whole song when she. They just they just don't know who's who. I mean, well, they just they yeah, haven't they haven't met them. Yeah, but okay. they never are confused about. Who no, they are. that's not entirely true, right? She's she hears. Yeah, you're right. I guess that's true. They hadn't met, and then they see each other, and they don't know that they are who they are. And that is really what has happened here uh, in this movie. Not that it was a mistaken identity. Certainly not that it was a multi-dimensional sliding doors style of mistaken identity. So I, it, it is what it is. We're going to move through it. We're going to move through it. But but what there we have go. here is a list of mistaken identity movies. Hopefully that are uh, entertaining and fun <laughs> to watch and loosely, uh, if if at all related to the young girls of Rochefort. Uh, and Andy, because. You weren't here last week. Uh, staying with the order, I think you should go first. <laughs> well, I, I couldn't remember what the crazy list was that you came up with. <laughs> so, so I did so, race car movies. I, so, well, I, I did. I, I did throw together mistaken identity movies, but I can't really say that they're you know in in comedies necessarily, or that. Well, actually, I take that back. A good a good chunk of them ended up comedies, and I also can't say that they involve uh, you know romance of of any kind. I mean, maybe there's a few, uh, but um, we'll see. We'll see. I guess we'll just leave it at that. So for my first choice, then I'm going with uh, Tom Hanks because, you know, I, I love the man. And uh, it's a movie that um, I watch probably um, way too often. And uh, or at least I have watched it way too often in my life because I just think it's absolutely hilarious. I don't know if as many people uh, find it as funny as I do, but uh, it's uh, The Man with One Red Shoe, which um, I really flip in love. It's it's the story about a man who um, is is accidentally uh, mistaken for a spy because uh, he is where he gets off the, the plane and he's wearing one red shoe and and these. The the uh, there's two CIA operations going on where one's one is the bad CIA guys, one's the good CIA guys, and the good CIA guys are trying to mislead the bad CIA guys, and so they just pick this guy at random, and then the bad guys start following him, thinking that he's this um, this person that they they uh, uh, this big spy, and of course uh, it it just uh, comedy ensues, you as you say, as uh, as they keep trying to track down Tom Hanks and. And things happen, and uh, you know it's it's a very very funny movie, and uh, that's my first choice of mistaken identities. Uh, there is romance; Tom <laughs> Hanks and Laurie Singer hook up, uh, I guess you could say, and then Carrie Fisher, of course, is in it, and uh, there's some great stuff. I love it. The Man that with was, the Red Shoe. Uh, you, yeah, that's our first steal. That was on my list. Believe it or hey, not, that was oh. on my list. So clearly, so clearly, my list. No, was you're not off at all. I told you, I completely <laughs> waived my own list. <laughs> Steve, what's yours? <laughs> so the list, it's more like guidelines with you two. It's just like, well, pick a movie <laughs> and just put it on your list. Okay. No, this was, this was, ch I, tr I tried to, st I go on, I, I look at the rundown. And I'm like, what did, what did they type in? What are the keywords I'm looking for? Oh, mistaken identity, comedy and families. Okay. I'll deliver that. That's what I will strive for. <laughs> so we'll start with Phil and Claire Foster. They just want to change up their boring married life and they steal a reservation at a restaurant for a very, at a very popular restaurant. They can't get a table. So they steal the reservation for somebody else and then get mistaken for a couple that have stolen a flash drive for a mob boss. And then, you know, hilarity and hijinks ensue for Steve Carell and Tina Fey in 2010's date night. There's our second steal. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> very. You didn't need okay, that one. I anyway. know, right? <laughs> Uh, okay, fine. I am, I'm going to go back then uh, a ways uh, because, you know, comedy and mistaken identity and 
sort of uh, family, I think you could make the case that uh, Monty Python's Life of Brian uh, actually fits the bill. Um, this is the, uh, the our, our title character, Brian, who's born in the stable right next to Jesus Christ and is mistaken for uh, the, the Messiah uh, himself. And I, uh, I really enjoy this film. I love the music. Uh, I always, always stay on uh, the bright side of life gentlemen life of brian 1979 there's another steal oh right there. outstanding retribution <laughs> for my next uh choice i'm going with one that um i think we very fairly could have added to our uh our star trek series <sighs> um because it is uh galaxy Quest, out loud, which Andy. is of course <laughs> See if you guys would if you would stick with the actual list, you guys wouldn't be stealing each other's. You go rogue, you suffer the consequences. Uh, well, apparently, yeah. Well, when we both go rogue, it's definitely not the same path. <laughs> so, <laughs> Galaxy Quest is a <clears throat> is a fantastic uh, Star Trek um, uh, parody that is as much an homage as anything, and it's just a, a brilliant story of uh, the cast of a TV show uh, called Galaxy Quest that is uh, mistaken for for an actual uh, intergalactic uh, crew and these aliens come and bring them to their uh, to their war so that these guys can help stop them stop the stop it basically um, I mean everybody in it is just just absolutely brilliant Tim Allen as the uh, captain Sigourney Weaver Alan Rickman Tony Shalhoub Sam Rockwell I mean it's just a fantastic cast uh, I know we've talked about it on on one of our lists before because of the time travel uh, silliness with the 13 seconds thing that they have but it's just such a stinking great movie and i absolutely love it so that's my next one well it's a it's a fine pick andy steve what, what's your <laughs> next one so i'm going classic with this one i'm going back to 1993 and the first film that kate beckinsale ever started whoa 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 did you just say 1993 is yeah. classic <laughs> well this is okay <laughs> hold on the story is classic because i'm talking about shakespeare's much ado about nothing Okay. Where there are a lot, there's lots of masks and deception and people pretending to be other people to betray or woo other people. So there's, there's marriages and happiness at the end, but along the way, there's lots of masks and mistaken identity that occur along the way. And you've just got an amazing cast. Kenneth Branagh directing with Michael Keaton and Keanu Reeves and Emma Thompson and Denzel Washington. It's just one of my favorite Shakespeare adaptations. That is a great choice. choice. That is a really great choice. And it wasn't on my list. So far, it's the only thing that hasn't been stolen. Uh, <laughs> my number two is, uh, it's a real classic, 1992, uh, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about uh, the uh, guitar-playing drifter mistaken for notorious assassin in Robert Rodriguez's blowout cheap hit, El Mariachi. Uh, the first in his Mexico trilogy. I really loved this movie. I thought it was just fantastic. And, and uh, um, that guitar case uh, became an icon uh, thanks, to, thanks to this. It was, it's great. It's bloody. It's, uh, and it was made for seven grand. I could, I, could scr I could scrounge up seven grand. Let's go make a movie. All right, Pete. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> whatever what are you stealing now uh, we're now i only have like one movie left on my list like I, I, yeah oh, you've stolen everything <laughs> well, I'm from torn, me. I'm... you've taken everything from me <laughs> i'm torn then if i should go with what what i would say is the is the obvious choice for mistaken identities or if i should pick one that that is less a little more obscure and i'm like which one is it which one should i avoid picking because pete <laughs> i don't want to take one i feel from like you. we need a, 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 a well-placed drum roll yes let's have that wow there you go it's a terrible ending for i know that, it needs that it, it sound, really needs it needs to finish <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go uh, with uh, a film that uh, I I've, I saw a few times, but I don't remember that well. But I do remember enjoying it quite a bit. It uh, the mistaken identity uh, silliness of the film just uh, cracked me up to no end, and I remember it being a lot of fun. It's probably something I need to watch again. Maybe it will hold up. Maybe it won't. But um, it it has a little bit of uh, a Hitchcock vibe to it uh, because, of course, it is. 
uh, spoofing slightly The Man Who Knew Too Much. It is, of course, John Emile's uh, film The Man Who Knew Too Little uh, with with uh, um, Bill Murray in the lead. You got Peter Gallagher, uh, Joanne Whaley, and Alfred Molina. Uh, Bill Murray, of, of course, is the guy who is mistaken as the uh, the uh, uh, spy and you have hitmen pursuing him trying to to get him uh, but and then he he kind of takes on this whole idea that oh this is this improv life theater thing and so he basically goes around pretending he's this this hitman and uh, while all this stuff is happening and he just has no clue that it's all real and that is uh, it made for a fun film and it might be something that wouldn't hold up again, but I do remember enjoying it quite a bit. So that's my final pick. The man who knew too little well, wasn't on my list. You win. <laughs> well, see, good. Then hopefully my other choice is. <laughs> OK, well, I can't wait to hear what that is, Steve. Kevin Franklin has got to skip town because he owes a lot of money to the mob. So he's at the airport trying to get out of town when he overhears a father and son who are waiting to pick up a childhood friend. Derek Bond, and upon hearing the father say that he hasn't seen Derek in 25 years and doesn't know what he looks like, Kevin decides to masquerade as Derek, and hilarity and hijinks ensue in 1995's House Guest with Sinbad and Phil Hartman. <laughs> that, was, that was so far from my list. <laughs> <laughs> didn't even touch my list. And so far from the rest of your list too. So it's funny. It's, it's, it's a, you went with that was your rogue choice. It, it's my. Fa it's a family comedy, and you've got mistaken identity. You've got an inner city guy who's got to masquerade as a vegan dentist. So you've got all kinds of fish out of water <laughs> ridiculousness going on, and it's 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 one of my guilty pleasures. If you haven't seen it, it's it's right there out of the nineties. It's just light hearted fun i mean phil hartman and simbad you know what you're gonna get that is yeah. very true we on that we agree uh okay my final film is it was at the very very bottom of my list i think it's the ultimate cheat uh, uh because it's not mistaken identity it's intentionally misled identity uh this is uh of course uh uh Dave uh, Kovich is uh, impersonating his side job is impersonating the good president Mitchell, and uh, and so Ivan Reitman Ivan Reitman liked him so much he put him in a movie called Dave, uh, and uh, it's it, when the the real president uh, suffers a stroke and so um, uh, Dave has to played by Kevin Klein has to step in and and be the the president and um, uh, it it's a uh, I really I my memory of this movie is really good like I really enjoyed it I enjoyed Laura Linney in it and Frank Langella's in it and I think it's just a, a funny everyman ascendancy movie that involves uh, mistaken identity for all those who don't know uh, that this is an impersonation going on um, and uh, and so there you have it I a, a movie I I remember well therefore we'll probably not watch again. Dave, no, I it, it almost made my list, but I was like, yeah, that's not really mistaken identity because it's it's really like an intentional yeah, right. deceit. But it was it was it was on my list of like, you know, in there it was it was I almost had a house theme because I had house guests. I almost threw in house sitter with Goldie Hawn and Steve Martin, but I felt no, that's more of a con. Yes, not mistaken. That identity, you're totally so. right. And when all of your other right. movies have been stolen, well, yes, yeah, so <laughs> reach into that barrel, Steve. You reach way to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I do remember liking Dave quite a bit. It was it was a very enjoyable film, and uh, yeah, it was it was one that I actually came close to actually putting on my list because you know like mines, but um but I didn't. Uh, my other choice that I was thinking of was North by Northwest, oh. but that felt like such, oh such the yes. obvious that um, you're right identity yeah. Movie. And then I had some romantic ones that I was like, well, these might fit. But then I was like, I don't know if it's mistaken identity, like the Princess Bride or Tootsie. It's really just kind of like disguises that one person is in, but the other person didn't know. So it's not, I don't know. It wasn't mistaken yeah. identity. I yeah. guess I could have done, gone that route. But. Well, well, yeah, because you, you can just cast the list aside, you know, I mean, that's. that's I, yeah, fine. exactly. No, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a very broad category of what we mean by mistaken identity well that's what happens when pete makes the list topic so i'm gonna go ahead and <laughs> mute for the next two minutes please begin <laughs> i don't even know what the what's the movie next week it's in a musical uh, right it's thoroughly modern millie uh which uh takes place in the 20s i i haven't seen it pete has but you know not knowing anything about the the movie itself i was just thinking <laughs> Just to be very broad so, and no, generic. No, time out. Wait. What? If Pete's seen it, he's the one most qualified to come up with this category. But he, yeah, he got it. <laughs> he just over that. 
<laughs> so no, I I think that we should just do movies that take place in the twenties that weren't shot in the twenties. It's very broad. It gives us a lot of things to choose from. Yes, uh, okay. weirdly that checks out. Um, that that can describe <laughs> thoroughly modern Millie. I can't believe you're not letting me play, but this is again the theme of this show is retribution. And so you win this round, Andy. I would like to know what list you no, would not, put forth because you have seen. I'm it. not going to talk about it. No. Oh no! I, no, now because we know. now I I don't know. Inquiring I don't minds. Wanna, I don't want to spoil it for you. I know you've had a busy week, and I just want you to watch this movie. So that Ooh, that can okay. be the the other list for next week is what were the lists that he would have come up with for this and he can give us his list of three other topics that it could have been as Pete's other super secret list. I I can't wait. Uh, yes, I can't wait. I can't wait for all nine of the super secret lists that Pete would have chosen for thoroughly modern really. That's awesome. Uh, this is that. Okay. So, so movies that are set in the twenties that weren't shot in the twenties. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, very generic. It's safe. A lot it's the of safe pick. So, Andy, you can't be saying, "Hey, this movie's set in 1932." That's close enough to the 20s. <laughs> he said it's the 20s. You said the 20s. Line. It's the 20s. Just a guideline. <laughs> it was in the early 20th century. It was 1940. That's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the same century. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right that's gonna be a good one thank you uh, uh thank you everybody for uh downloading and listening to this show we sure appreciate it we hope you have some some fine dishwashing to do this weekend thanks for sticking with us and supporting us and helping us do what we do and uh thank you guys steve andy for your early morning time i'll let you get to it get to that uh, mechanic andy get to that mechanic. gotta run it's all olympics today mm. go for the gold stay gold pony boy <laughs>